Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of your Rehab Power Hour. This is your community to engage in virtual rehab together and a place to discuss all things neuro rehab, from the science, the people behind it, and the individual journeys of recovery. I'm your host, as always, Dr. Nick Housley. Uh, thanks so much for being here with me on this Monday morning, or Monday evening, rather, not morning. Uh, apologies. Um, uh, I'm joined here um, by my ho my co-host, actually, um, David. Welcome, David. I believe, David, you are muted, my friend. Let's see if we can get you I online. was muted. I was there muted. There we go. Uh, Excellent. Now we have you online. <laughs> happy, to, happy to be here. Excited to talk about all things neuro rehab tonight. Great, great, great. Thanks for being here, David. Um, and as always, we welcome anyone recovering from neurologic injury, your friends, family members, or care partners, as well as their clinicians to engage in this conversation and this community with us um, here um, at this time, three times a week, I think. We're going to go Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, we have a, a great show tonight. Uh, there's kind of a lot going on, and so we're going to get right to it. Um, we have uh, Dr. Steve Wolf um, back with us, and we're going to talk about a really cool seminal paper in neuro rehab. Um, but before we dive into that, I have a couple of sort of high-level announcements just to remind you guys. If you have uh, questions or comments for me, my, uh, my co-host David, um, or any of our guests, um, feel free to reach out to us. There's three ways you can do that. The first of those is actually in the live stream. I will be tracking the um, individual comments and uh, being able to respond to you guys um, in kind there. Um, if you have maybe a longer um, comment or question that you want to send us, and maybe it's not during the Rehab Power Hour time, feel free to email us at rehabpowerhour at modusnova.com. Um, you can also do the same thing via um, via phone. If you are more comfortable with that, feel free to give us a call. That number is 404-594-4244. Um, you can call and leave a voicemail anytime, day, night, uh, whenever you're thinking about neuro rehab. Um, let me know. Let me know what you're thinking about, and we'll try to address that on the next Rehab Power Hour. I'm looking forward to your questions there, guys. And as always, if you think this is helpful, um, like what we're doing here, feel free to like the, the live stream and um, maybe share with your friends. Um, we've got now a, a built up a nice repository of content of, of, of good resources for you um, and some really cool stories to, to share as well. So um, feel free to share this with anyone you think might um, benefit from it, as well as join our support group. That is a, a good group for you guys, right? We, uh, we curate that content to make sure that um, it's going to be a good resource for you to learn about renal rehab. And if you have questions about your hand mentor or foot mentor, uh, we'll do our best to um, jump on there and get those questions answered for you um, in a timely, timely fashion. Um, also, if you'd like to be a featured guest on a uh, future Rehab Power Hour, do let us know. You can um, ask in the, the live stream here or um, uh, send me an email too. And again, it's at rehabpowerhour at modusnova.com. Um, just a quick reminder, we do have a live session going on right now. So if you have your hand mentor, foot mentor, you can power that on. And the top right-hand side, you'll see a join live session button. And that will be able to uh, uh, bring you into a shared prescription and we can all do it together. If you don't have a hand mentor, foot mentor, no problems. Um, get your home exercise program out and uh, we'll keep you company uh, while you do that rehab. It's just another great excuse to get um, another hour of rehab um, into your sort of portfolio there to keep you progressing. Um, and I think that's about all I have on the on the high level announcements. Um, David, did I miss anything there? And I think we are on mute again, yeah, David. That's, that, we are on mute. No, that, I think that you've got everything here and uh, we're also Excellent. glad to be on tonight with both audio and video. We thank everyone for sticking with yeah. us. Uh, <laughs> on, on Friday night, we had some uh, technical issues, but uh, of course, technology, uh, we've got it figured out and we're, we're glad to be, uh, be on with everyone tonight. Excellent. Yeah. And I, yeah, personal apology there for me. Um, sorry, guys. I know there were some issues on the, uh, my video was, was uh, choppy and maybe we had some, some link issues. Um, but I think we did record that. And if you uh, um, have any interest in it, uh, we had a couple of really good spotlight users and some nice content there, some nice questions. Um, so go, go back and look in the repository for last Friday. We'll have that up as soon as possible. If it's not already up. Um, very good. And so I think um, because we have so much to go over today, I think we'll get right into the details here. Um, I want to welcome back uh, Dr. Steve Wolf. Um, uh, Steve, welcome. Good to be back. Excellent. Thank Thanks you. so much for being here. Yeah. So um, we invited you to have a conversation about um, one of the these sort of seminal papers um, in neuro rehab. And uh, we're going to get into it. And I think we haven't done this in a while. We'd like to talk about a formal paper. And um, I guess my, my main goal is to kind of give you guys a high level overview of what this paper is about and its importance. And then I think um, David and, uh, and Dr. Wolf and I uh, can then maybe kind of break things down and to kind of contextualize it and see what does this mean for us? Where are we, uh, where are we now because of this paper? And you know, where would we be if we didn't have this paper in this series of studies? 
And so I guess we can kind of get straight to it and I'll do my best to give a super high level elevator pitch. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll rely on you guys out there to let me know if there's something that I, um, that I skirt over or if I use a term that you don't understand, don't hesitate to ask me. I'm happy to break things down again. But I guess first off here, this is paper that was published in um, 1996. So it's an oldie, but it's a goodie. Um, and it's uh, from a, a famous uh, neurophysiologist, um, Randy Nudo. And uh, you hopefully you guys can see that in my uh, my shared screen here. And we won't go through the paper word by word, but I'm just going to give you kind of a high level um, overview. And so their main focus of this paper, um, and it is a complex one, and so we don't have to go into all the details. Um, but their main focus was trying to understand what are called the neural determinants of rehabilitation recovery and how a uh, upper extremity improves after a rehabilitation um, uh, session, basically, right? They, we knew that uh, things could change, uh, but they didn't know exactly what mechanisms were happening inside of the brain to contribute to that. And in order to actually kind of peer into the system, uh, we have to use things called preclinical models. And so these are studies that are not done in humans. These are studies that are done, in, in this case, they're done in, in non-human primates. It's done in, in a monkey study. And um, they did a number of things, but the most important thing was they actually understood, they, they tracked how an individual, um, these groups of monkeys were actually performing tasks. And these were tasks that related to fine motor and gross motor skills, such as picking up a pellet of food. This is something that monkeys readily do, and so it's a very easy thing to, to get them to train up on do, and do this. And so um, before the whole study started, what they did is they um, uh, figured out how these monkeys could perform this task. And they basically quantified how many um, uh, uh, basically movements it took for them to successfully pick up a piece of food. And that was their measure, um, or one of their measures, like a clinical one. And this would be very similar to something that you might do in the clinic, um, such as uh, picking up a, um, a ball bearing or a pencil, some of things like that. Then what they did is these authors then mapped the motor cortex of these individual monkeys. And they did this in a, an invasive way, but they did basically these micro stimulation studies where they could actually peer inside of the cortex and figure out which parts of the brain were controlling certain movement patterns and which, which um, brain areas were responding to movements in certain parts of the, of the limb. And this allowed them to then map their limb space onto the brain. Um, and you guys may have seen these kind of cool images of like a, of a human kind of mapped onto our cortex. It's called a homunculus. Don't worry about that term. But effectively, uh, what they did is they mapped this part of the brain, the motor cortex. And then what they did is they induced a stroke in these, um, a small sort of localized stroke in these, um, in these animals. And then what they did, they had them either do um, no rehab at all, and that was called a control group. And they did another group of animals that were doing rehab motions. And they did a very, very um, stereotypical uh, movement pattern where they were training to pick up this uh, food pellet again. And they did this a lot. Um, they did this on, on the order of around 400 to 600 repetitions per day. And what they uh, found, and I'll actually kind of go over here to some of these images really quickly. And I blew up another one to kind of show you. So here is our, um, our, our cortex here. And this is the area we were studying, the primary motor cortex. And they did these mapping studies, and it looks like this sort of amalgam of, of, of space, kind of this gray area that's mapped. And this is where the hand area was. So they, they had um, these individual electrodes that were mapping where the hand was responding. And then they did a, an actual lesion, a controlled stroke in this various area. And then what the authors did was they broke these two um, groups down, and some of them got rehab, and some of them didn't get rehab. And what you can see here on my, uh, my gray area here is our original hand area that controls our hand function. And this is, of course, a simplification, but it's a good, it's a good uh, representation of what kind of happens. And the red area there is that lesion. And you can see that what happens after the no rehab group, that area actually shrinks. And there's a lot of complex mechanisms that can go um, into this. But effectively, what happens is that lesion causes areas around the lesion to actually shrink and so you lose more control um that's really cool that. yeah yeah david your question yeah no that's that's really interesting uh uh nick dr housley um mm -hmm. here we have kind of uh on the left uh if i if i may uh, mm -hmm. if i understand correctly the the dark portion in that first circle is parts right of the brain that's controlling the hand 
correct. And that, that red portion is where the stroke or the, the damage was in the brain. Yep. Correct. And then on they got the two the monkeys, the two groups of monkeys got split into two groups. One mm -hmm. of them got no rehabilitation, and mm -hmm. then their brains were scanned again. You could see up yep. top that yep. the damage was still there in red. Um, mm -hmm. and the part of the brain that was controlling the hand got much smaller. That dark portion mm -hmm. shrank a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, while on the bottom side here, uh, we can see that the dark portion changed in some mm -hmm. ways, um, but in size was not so different from uh, 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 pre previous to the injury. Uh, you yeah. can still see the damage there, but but it is noticeable how big of a difference uh, mm -hmm. in, in the brain uh, between the top and the bottom, between no rehabilitation and doing this uh, kind of what you said, high uh, high dose repetitive task practice, hundreds of movements. Was it hundred movements a day? Was that Six, right? It was on. So they didn't def define it in this paper specifically. What they did is this is actually the way these big science sort of glossy periodicals um, uh, work. They actually kind of have a, a a long series of papers. So this was actually a culmination of a lot of other studies. And in this previous study, they defined the rehab program in which these these individual animals were doing 600 repetitions of picking up those those um, um those food those pellets, pellets per day. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. lots of practice. I imagine hours yeah. and hours of practice. So we really can see the results there of mm -hmm. uh, of those 600 movements a day. What what it can lead to in actual changes in the brain. Yeah, cool. and I think this is this is the most interesting part here, guys. This is a little bit colorful, so I'll kind of walk you through this. <laughs> The thing that's actually most relevant, I want you guys to pay attention to, is the red area. Okay, so the red area is the movements, or is the hand area that's mapped, or I guess the brain area that's mapped onto controlling the fingers for this this task specifically. And you can see that it has sort of this amalgamation, and you can see it kind of wraps around in certain areas, and it's a little bit intermingled. That's okay, and you can see this um, area down here that's a dotted white area. This is where they induce the stroke. But this is really what gives you some indication of the real change that can occur. And this is kind of these wow. areas get taken over. And so if you see over here in our proximal segments, this is kind of our shoulder and our uh, upper uh, um, arm areas that are mapped. And that's, that, our, that's the upper, our, that's the upper yep, segment. That's, yep, that's our, our the proximal shoulder and our elbow areas here that are mapped on. And they're kind of highlighted in, um, in teal or you know bluish color here. And they've got these arrows that they're indicating. And you can see after the rehab, this is the same animal, by the way, um, same brain, uh, not different brain. I'm not doing a magic trick on you here. Um, the same brain mapped um, three or four weeks later, I think they did. It depends on the individual study. But you can see that that hand area starts to encroach and uh, expand into other areas of control. And this is one of those mechanisms by which um, sort of is classically believed that neuroplasticity occurs, right? It kind of um, takes over and reorganizes. And this is the direct representation of that reorganization. Um, and this process doesn't happen or it happens, let's say, less frequently if you don't do rehabilitation. Um, and so that's one of the, this is some of the seminal study, or one of the seminal studies that kind of um, developed this um, strong rationale for being able to induce these changes in the brain. But that so there's been a lot of things since then. Go ahead, Steve, yes. If people yeah. um, this first, and my question, how, how do they do this? How do they know uh, that those areas represent the areas of the upper extremity that they say they do. And if you look very carefully, you see those little dots. Mm -hmm. Those little dots represent the locations where these microelectrodes are yep. put into the, the brain in the in the follow motor yep. cortex. And what you do is is pretty straightforward. Do a little bit of stimulation, and then they look very carefully at the the upper extremity of the monkey in this case, and look to see where they see activity. Yep. Does, is there a movement or there's muscle activity and where does it occur? And then they correlate the location of that little dot with the movement that they see. So in this case, if it's they color coded red, if the movements that they saw at those specific locations were in the digits, yep. right? So you can, and so you can see what's happened here is it looks like the digit area, the red area has literally invaded a portion of the shoulder, the blue, mm -hmm. bluish area, right? But the same location. So clearly there's some form of change or plasticity that's related to the nature of the tasks that the animals are being trained to do over and over again. Oh, okay. Yeah, so this is really the effects of 
that rehabilitation that we talk about, that we, you know, we talk about more repetitions, more hours of rehabilitation. Um, in this case, uh, we can see in the brain uh, the actual changes of the brain and, and how how uh, it's remapping itself, it's rewiring itself. Um, and and uh, the that that's a very interesting thing you uh, you you said there, uh, Doctor Wolf, with the the electrodes, the white dots there. Um, I always am, you know, the the imagery that I that I kind kind of see is uh, it's like uh, there's all these switches and knobs and these control mechanisms in front of us. It's like a a, a pilot in an airplane, and they've got that wall of uh, of gauges and knobs and switches. Um, and but our brains are are very good at operating all these kind of different. Uh, 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 parameters um, in our daily lives as, as we kind of go about. But with an injury, with kind of parts of that system taken down, um, the the there's all those sometimes a mix up. Sometimes there's not really the ability to to reactivate everything that all the control mechanisms that we had control over before. Uh, but, but the amazing thing the brain can do is after uh, lots of practice can rewire and change the orientation of those switches around um and uh we can kind of see this uh with the the red kind of moving around uh out of where the injury was in that dotted white circle on the bottom right um and and with lots of practice kind of uh getting back uh some of these movements or or i you know from mm -hmm. from at least what we can see in this picture yeah and, and actually just... david i would suggest just no offense to pilots but um you know there's maybe several hundred switches in the brain, there's something like uh, 80 billion, 90 billion neurons that are, are not doing more. one, th uh, not doing one thing at a time. They're also interacting. So <laughs> a few more, yeah. when you turn this one knob, it turns all of the other knobs potentially. So <laughs> if uh, someone would like at some point, we can not t tonight, but another time, if you'd like, I can actually show you these maps in humans mm -hmm. where we've done yeah. stimulation to try to get responses in very specific muscles that move the hand, just like the hand mentor, that move the wrist mm -hmm. and fingers up into extension and show you how those maps change over time when one does repetitive movement in this, in this, in this particular case, doing a procedure called constraint-induced movement therapy, where patients had to use their impaired upper extremity by immobilizing their better arm for a defined period of time. And we can see how these maps grow and how that growth is maintained months after the end of the therapy, which yeah. is pretty proof positive that we are inducing some changes in the brain that are due to this repetition. And perhaps over the next four months, which is the time period we follow folks, those repetitions continue in the absence of the training yeah. and it's mm -hmm. still seen in our mapping of the brain. And actually, everyone here in the in the uh, the live stream here, let me know. Um, do you want to hear this? Or you want to see um, Dr. Wolf bring some of these uh, images? I think it'd be kind of cool. Uh, let me know in the chat here. Give me a thumbs up if you like that idea, um, and we'll uh, we'll try to coordinate that for a future Rehab Power Hour. Oh, that'd be very I always cool I, will, I always will take an opportunity to talk more data. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I I had a couple of uh, questions, quick questions for both uh, you, uh, Dr. Nick, and, and and you, Dr. Steve, as well. Uh, kind of looking into to this, um, you know, what what impact? So we talked about the science here. We talked a lot about the science of of, um, of what we found repetitions can do in terms of changes to the brain. But what what impact did this have on uh, stroke rehabilitation uh, for for stroke survivors? Today? Before we knew this, before there was kind of and maybe not just this one paper, but this entire body of work. Uh, what was rehab like and how did that change from uh, looking at these kinds of, uh, from this study and other studies like this? Dr. Wolf, go for it. I think, I think you, bring, yeah, you bring a really unique perspective because uh, um, you've kind of seen a lot of that seed change, right? Yeah, I think with um, what this boils down to is this notion of repetition the con context, the way in which that repetition is applied mm -hmm. and how that relates to some kind of change, which is functionally relevant and important. Um, I think for those of you who are on this call or listening and um, are patients or families of patients, I, I think the nature of the rehabilitation that we go through is such that often we don't get to do as many repetitions as we would like in trying to retrain an upper extremity or even in our walking for that matter. 
um, because there's so many things that the therapists are trying yeah. to do in a defined period of time. But I think we're learning now that there's a very strong relationship between the frequency, the number of times someone tries to do a movement, and the possibility of causing changes that look something like this in folks who have initially movement capability. The problem that we have is that without much question, we really have undersold and underused the amount of time in which this should be done to increase the number of repetitions that begins in, in, in humans, in us, in patients, hundreds and hundreds of repetitions per day. And you know, we have this notion so often that we have a therapy that we do in the clinic and the therapist is there or the therapist assistant is there to assist in functionally related activities. And I suspect in an hour or 45 minute session, if you ever bother to total up the number of times you've done a repetition movement, I'm willing to bet it's less than 100. Well, Dr. Wolf, now I, I will say this: <laughs> we, we were we were going to talk about this next session. I think. Okay, wait, but, just, but the point, yeah, the yeah, point is yeah. to do uh, a teaser. The teaser question, for next Rehab Power Hour is that you need a lot of repetitions in order to pr produce these kinds of changes. And yeah. in the clinic, we don't always do that. But I think we're beginning yeah. to learn the importance of repetition, not just in the clinic, but outside mm -hmm. the clinic as well. Absolutely. Stop. No, that's us. That, such a fantastic uh, perspective there, Dr. Wolf. Uh, certainly, I, I think the point that doing rehab for doing rehab, um, that's great, but really uh, papers like this and a lot of the science that comes from a lot of uh, uh, from from Dr. Nudo and, and, and of course the body of work since then have focused on not just number of hours of rehab, but also the repetitions, that the repetitions really drives kind of a, it plays an important role in uh, the rewiring and, and, and uh, in the recovery of, of um, function and of changes and in, in changes of the brain. And uh, looking, looking at repetitions and not just hours, um, that is such an important perspective there as well. There is one more and, important piece to this that I'm sure we'll get into. Please, yeah. It's not yeah. just the oh. number of repetitions. Yeah. It's the circumstances under which those repetitions are done. And yeah. the patient, much like the patient's brain, has to be challenged. It mm -hmm. has to be challenged in a way that can be built upon, because that may very well be the underlying basis mm -hmm. for some changes in the brain that are functionally relevant. Yeah, and and I'm, I think we'll we'll uh, talk about some of this hopefully next week uh, yep. with with uh, as well with uh, another paper that we plan on talking about, uh, going in more into depth about you know what what repetitions uh, really do. But no, that's that's such a great point as well, uh, Dr. Wolf. That um, you know there's such a big difference, uh, a, a spectrum of the quality of the repetition, whether from, you know, on one far side where um, you're just, you're, 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 uh, a limb is being moved by somebody else and the individual is not paying any attention. Um, that uh, has, you know, perhaps very low quality in, in creating uh, or, or prompting that, that, um, that, that rewiring that neuroplasticity all the way to the other side, which you were mentioning, where there's very purposeful, very engaged, um, and also challenging types of motions that uh, the repetitions that really do a lot more um, than, um, than, than those lower quality ones. You know, certain uh, topic to spend a time uh, del delving into. Uh, I want, Nick, I want to see hear your, uh, your opinion as uh, your thoughts on this as well, but you know, I want to make sure that, uh, um, uh, we get a chance uh, from the audience if you have any questions uh, about kind of what what uh, what you see here, how how the brain is really changing, uh, where especially that dark red portion that was on the bottom on the left side of our our screen right now, um, mm -hmm. that dark red portion in the bottom that was controlling the hands, the digits, uh, and and having a lot of training, uh, a lot of repetitions, and you can see that that dark red portion expanding away from that dotted white area where the injury was, where the stroke was, and kind of going out towards other parts um, of, of that, that brain uh, section we have here, um, that, that, um, that, and really that recruiting, the bringing of those other neurons that are still you know, doing well, that are still healthy to help with some of those movements. Such, a, such an incredible view. Um, uh, Dr. Dr. Housley, um, any, any kind of closing thoughts here as we wrap up? Yeah, I think one thing that's really interesting, I think, is that um, one of you guys, or maybe a thought that's kind of um, uh, going around here is that, well, what happens to the shoulder, right? Well, what happens when these other neurons kind of take over? 
right? Um, and this is a, this is an interesting situation. And I think with respect to these um, these individual animals that they studied, they didn't see any decrement in performance, upper extremity performance um, in the shoulder, right? They were they were focused more on the um, the the end effector here, which is their functional ability to grasp a um, uh, a what would you call it? Uh, a food pellet, a pellet of food, a yeah. pellet of food, right? And so um, the thing that's interesting is that the total area of the hand is actually conserved, um, which is really interesting. And it kind of just eats into the shoulder. And it's like, well, what's the consequence for the shoulder? Does that mean that there is some like, additional reservoir of functioning that we can kind of pull from? You know, what's what's the, what's the consequence of this? And I think these are um, kind of still some maybe open questions um, that are that are out there. Um, and, um, you know, so as a scientist, it really is interesting from my perspective, all of these studies just, um, generate more questions than, um, than are answered, <laughs> right? They generate so, some good, so good answers. Go ahead. We had that portion controlling the shoulder up top. Yeah. Uh, we had the portion controlling the, the, the fingers, the digits on the mm -hmm. bottom. There was an yep. injury on the bottom and they kind of, the, 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 the digits kind of push the, the dark red, push the light blue, the shoulder out. Mm -hmm. um, and but as far as from what I can tell, uh, Dr. Hauser, you're saying is that the shoulders they didn't in the study they didn't find that the uh, the primates or the the monkeys in this case had loss of shoulder function. Uh, is that so, right? So they didn't. As far they as didn't, they could they, tell. Yeah, they didn't evaluate in an objective way shoulder performance um, per se, right? And there's some complicated things here about whether or not there's co-activation of individual areas, these sorts of things. It gets really complex. And I see Dr. Wolf. <laughs> well, I, think this, I, I, I don't think, know how much we really want to drill down to this, but suffice to say yeah. that that's, that's correct. It's highly unlikely that although that blue area seems to be invaded, shoulder mm -hmm. function does not compromise that much because we sometimes forget that there are other pathways below the, that level of the brain yep. that yep, activate right. the sh shoulder muscles. Yep. Right. And that's the other right. thing that's really important too, right? It's, there's multiple neurons, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an exchange, right? That first uh, the, in the motor cortex is just one of the aspects, right? There's a whole circuit that has to go and be recruited successfully in order to generate a purposeful movement. We're talking about one link in the chain. And yeah. the, the, the fidelity that you get with an individual neuron to a muscle is at the spinal cord level. We're mm -hmm. talking abstractions here into the motor cortex. And so right. I just, it's an, it's an interesting concept. And so, I was, so, I was it's, 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 it, so what we're saying is to do a movement, there's several steps, maybe there's five steps or 10 steps. And this is one of those steps in this chain that we're looking at how the, the movements are being done. But of course that, you know, uh, movements are so so much more complex than this. And I think in the first uh, uh, diagram you had, Dr. Uh, Housley, uh, we could see that we're just looking at a small part of the brain as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and certainly, you know, there there are so many effects and the brain has has so much complexity that that we're still still unraveling very much so may very much so today. But but overall, of course, kind of bringing us back here, uh, we can really see the effect of repetitions here um, and mm -hmm. both in the scans of the brain and also in the, the monkeys themselves, right? Uh, uh, they yeah, were... so here's, there, there are their movements right there. So you guys can probably see this really quickly. You can see the pre-performance movements and these are basically how many individual attempts it takes to pick up something. And you can see that they get really worse on the y-axis, higher is much worse and then they get they get better after after the fact. Um, so there's a spike, it really goes yep. up and they have to attempt many, many times and we don't want that because they have to keep yep. trying. That means they're failing a lot. And then kind yep. of over time, you could kind of see that they're stabilizing trends, this is maybe trends important down. part as well. Yep. Yeah, that that they don't really get back. They're not getting back, at least consistently not getting back to their pre-injury levels, but they are very much close to um, the number of attempts uh, that, mm -hmm. that they need especially relative to right after their injury you can kind of see yep. those very high spikes uh, but yep. but certainly that's a you know that's a lot of other uh coverage this that, is yeah um, this, is, this is also that we'll have really i think it's there's yeah. an important point here for those who are interested without dwelling into part of the fun dwelling and it's just too much because there are different sized dwells mm -hmm. which these monkeys have to reach for yeah we were focusing on the more complex one so which is a small at the open circles yeah. Those are large. Those are large yep. wells with a lot of room on the bottom for the monkey to move their hand around to yep. grasp the pellet. And as you can see, after the um, injury, which is that high uh, solid line, the center line their right performance here, performance yeah. does not change that much. They still yep. can use the larger wells. Mm -hmm. It's the smaller wells which require much more finite yep. movement that are compromised. 
And this tells us, when you think about comparing this to the human condition, that these types of injuries may not be as severe as the kinds of injuries that we see in, in ourselves. Yep. Because I think if, if a patient was able to use their hand to get an object out of a large well and still be able to do that, that's pretty darn good. Yep. But in this case, the monkeys, even after their fairly fine injuries, were still yep. able to do that. So this is... And that is, the, I think that's a complication though with these models, right, Steve? Because um, there, there's are experimental models where you have to do very specific injuries, yeah. and so, and that just means that we have better control over it, so we can ask certain questions. But these are things that we can address another day, I guess. We have more time yeah. to get into some of the weeds. So. Well, you know, we're we're a little bit over time here, but that was a fantastic science corner. Um, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Housley and 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 uh, Dr. Wolf for kind of giving us uh, really that insight. We really, you know, it. It's great that we we talk about repetitions a lot, but it's great to see uh, and and uh, see the science behind it. Really, the image uh, the images that kind of really represent what the brain is doing. And I, th I think that's uh, from a lot of feedback from our audience here. That's been that's been really cool to to see. And uh, there's a there's a, ask, everyone's asking for more, so we'll have to we'll have to kind of follow up with these. Uh, uh, I think next week we'll go even delve deeper into repetitions and uh, maybe looking at the number of repetitions and and what that really means on the on the rehab side. Uh, yep. Very good. I, I think we've got a few questions from the audience as as well here, but but uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Housley, uh, we're going to get to an assessment uh, first. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think we're going to go to Jim first. Uh, Jim, can you hear me? Let's see if we can get Jim's audio up and running here. We were talking a little bit before we had power hour, and I think we had things going. Um, Jim, can you hear me? Jim, you might be muted. Your mic might be muted. You were coming in pretty clear in our pre-show uh, warm-up, if you will. Well, we, we can try to get Jim back here uh, on, on the line. Um, yeah. Like in the meantime, we can go to Jerry, though, if you would. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes, we, we can hear you loud and clear, Jerry. How are you? I'm doing terrific. Thank you for uh, having me. Appreciate it. Great, great to have you. Yeah, and and today uh, we, we had you last Wednesday kind of talk about your story, uh, your stroke, and, and kind of really the journey that you've been through. Quite inspiring. We had a lot of comments from uh, from our audience here that, that really enjoyed your story um, and uh, took, uh, took uh, inspiration from kind of your spirit and how how hard you fought and continue to fight for uh, for your rehab and for your recovery and uh, and we certainly we applaud all of that um, and, uh, and you know so happy to have you here I think today we're going to have uh, maybe you do an assessment with uh, Dr. Housley uh, how does that sound Oh that sounds great I'm looking forward to it actually All right well, Dr. Housley take fun. it away yeah. Well, Jerry, it is great to see you again. And I think uh, it's been a while since we've worked together. So I'm excited yeah. to see how things are going. Uh, first, tell me how things are going with your hand mentor. How is how's your rehab? Are you being consistent? Yeah, yeah. The, the thing with is, um, which I've noticed more and more of, is the tone. Okay. Yeah. What it's about it? Yeah, the tone makes a big difference. Using the hand mentor and as well as the, uh, the range of motion makes a big difference. I mean, I can see... Um, even without the hand mentor, I could see some improvements that I haven't seen. And I'm 10 years out post strokes. So this hand mentor has been like a blessing to me. Yeah. And I also see you hit the 30 hour challenge. You have your repping your t shirt. <laughs> love it. Love Excellent. it. Love the shirt. <laughs> and, my, and my wife didn't shrink it. So it still fits. <laughs> Very good. Well, Jerry, this uh, uh, this will be a pleasure for uh, to work with you again today. So um, you're an expert at this, and so you can even walk me through this. But let's go ahead and go to the assessment um, uh, page for me real quick. We'll spin this up. Um, you guys following along with me on our live stream here, you'll be familiar with this. This is our provider dashboard. Um, you can see on the, on the left-hand side that you can see a live angle. That number is uh, currently in a minus value right now, and that's um, showing that Jerry's in a flexion state. So we've got primarily two things going on here, guys. We've got flexion and extension. And so whenever we have a number in the negative, we'll know that we're in a flexion. And when we have a positive value, we know we're in an extension. Just a little convention here. I like to just kind of set it up. And in the center there, you can see a value right now. It's centered at zero. This is basically a percentage. So it goes from zero to 100%. And this is how much help the hand mentor is providing. 
Um, and so what we're going to do, Jerry, as you know this by now, we're going to do a three-step process. We'll figure out how much um, what we've got active-wise, and then okay. we'll do a passive check, figure out your tone, and uh, and we'll go from there and do an active assist check, okay? Okay, let's go. Okay, very good. So um, Jerry's always a rock star with his rehab, and so he's got pretty pretty dense data here on the right-hand side. I'm switching over to my, my, um, uh, my dashboard view here so I can see the live stream. But uh, I'm just going to quick um, assessment here where, where we kind of are. Actually, it looks pretty good, Jerry. Um, I'll remind myself of the previous values here, and I'll clear this, and then we can go ahead and start. So first things first, let's go ahead and have you move um, down into flexion as far as you can for me. Beautiful. All the way down. Very, very good. And then I'll have you relax, take a big breath. Ooh, make sure we're, make sure we're good and stable there. And I'll have you go up and do extension for me as far as you can. Up, 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 up. Ooh, beautiful, beautiful. That is a lot, my friend. Okay, so before we were at about 34 degrees of extension and we're now, you can go and relax, Jerry. Now we're at 55, 54 degrees. Right. That's pretty good, Jerry. Um, and when, pretty good. When you say before, uh, Dr. Yeah. Housley, how, how what, what, when was before? Uh, because I, I'm curious too. I, I think, Jerry, you've been, you've been at this for some time. Is that right? I have. I've, I've been... So yeah, I think we started yeah, using this yeah. last year, right, Jerry? We were, we're a couple months into this point, aren't we? Yes. A couple, yeah. six months in, something like that? Yeah, I think real close to six months. Okay. I remember the last time we did an assessment, I think it was probably end of last year, I think. Yeah. Is that about right? Yeah. So last time I we kind of worked right. together. Okay. So, so we so, went from something like 30 degrees, which is maybe if you can demonstrate for us, Dr. Housley, something like something like yeah. this into extension. So this is like zero. And then we'll call this basically where Jerry is right now. Uh, and then he's, he's probably there. about there beforehand. It's about 34, so, yeah. 30 degrees. There. That, was, that was before. And now he's at the 55, which is almost, which is almost all the way up here. Yeah, basically. And that's, that's fantastic. Um, and, and you guys remember too, that the hand mentor does have a limit to it, right? We put those hard constraints in there to be safe. Right. Um, and so 55 degrees is the limit um, uh, of the hand mentor itself. And so this is this is really good, Jerry. Um, but let's go ahead and do the next step really quickly here. Relax for me. I'm going to take over. I'm going to put some um, assistance in. We'll figure out what that um, tone curve looks like, okay? Okay. So we'll kick in here. And as and because, Dr. Housley is yeah. kind of going go through this, um, yeah, and we are talking about before, the, the hand mentor really only goes up as far as 55 degrees so jerry you're you're really maxing out there um in terms of uh how much how much extension how much upward motion you have yep, oh. yep. and and yeah. yeah dr housley you're doing a, a you mentioned a, a tone curve here what is yeah you know, kind of walk yeah us so bit. i mean uh, I've, I've called this multiple things over the over our rehab power hours this is basically a passive range of motion check but i like to call it a tone curve because it, it gives me an indication of what the relationship is between force and length that's fundamentally what tone is and um, this gives me some indication about whether or not there is any sort of weird hitches, any kick-ins of spasticity, um, or whether or not the, that relationship has gotten steeper or, or more shallow. And um, let me tell you why that's important. So let's, let's think about it this way. In a simple sense, if we have a, a, a muscle in this case, and I try to stretch it, my flexors here, when I try to go up into extension, my flexors have to lengthen, okay? Now, if I put X amount of force into my hand and I go up, let's say one time, we'll just keep these arbitrary units, um, maybe 10 degrees, okay? I put in 10 pounds of force and my hand goes up 10 degrees, okay? But now if I have a lot of tone in my hand, I put 10 pounds of force in my hand and my hand only goes up and my, my wrist only goes up maybe two degrees or five degrees. So you can see there's a relationship there between the amount of force that's applied and the, the requisite change in, in length or range of motion. And so this gives us a really nice indication to figure out whether or not um, we're seeing any decrease in that um, in that tone. I'm, I don't know your, what your slope was off of hand, Jerry, so we're gonna have to go back and look at this, but okay. I don't see any indication of, of spasticity kicking in here. And it's a pretty smooth curve. Um, there was a little bit of a, um, a plateau there, but that was me slowing down. I didn't, I didn't raise the, uh, um, the pressure um, fast enough. And so you see that corresponding plateau here in force when we were just chatting real quick mm -hmm. and that right. change in the, in the range of motion there. So this looks pretty good to me. I'm going to go ahead and drop it out real quick. Just relax. I'm mm -hmm. going to look for any residuals in here and we'll see what we got there. And as expected, we have a little bit of a, of a increase there and that's okay. Um, so there is a little bit of tone there. 
And that's that's pretty good. That's that's pretty good. We want to make sure we're not hitting the table as well, Jerry. I think you've got no, a pretty good setup over there where you're you're completely overhanging. Yep. Yeah. So I think Jerry can go down again though, it, right? Yeah. Yep. And okay. honestly, guys, this is just a little bit of residual. Um, this is a check not only for Jerry, but this is a check for his hand mentor to make sure that we're mapping those correctly because there's a little bit of residual pressure in the system. And so we have to make sure that if, if you don't have the ability to um, flex against this, we want to make sure we can accommodate that. This okay. is sort of a, this is a, a marrying of the technical elements and you and your physiology. Okay. okay. Very good. So we'll stop this real quick. And I'm actually going to go in here um, and do a quick check. So the very first thing we're going to do here, Jerry, is we're going to really increase the range of motion by about 10 degrees here. I'm going to probably go up to 48. I don't want to go all, maybe 50. We'll see. Let's do 50. Um, we'll hit that assistance there. What I want you to do is I want you to go ahead and um, try to go up as far as you can again for me. So RP, you can do ascension. Lift further than your, your. Yes, please. All the way up for me. All the way up, all the way up, all the way up. Very good, very good, very good. And I'm gonna have you relax and I'll have you go down into flexion from as far as you can. And that's gonna be a bit harder. And that's okay. Very I'm good. Very, very good. And oh. relax for me. Relax. Good. Okay. Very good. I don't think we need that much assistance, Jerry. Honestly, okay. I think we're gonna bring down the assistance. Okay. okay? So what I'm going to do now, let's go ahead and have you go back on your top left side, and we'll do a couple of in-game checks. Okay. So have you go back on the top left side, and we'll go to home, and we'll begin therapy. We'll do a couple of things. I've already made the adjustment for your range of motion to um, accommodate your new increase. Um, because you had about 20 extra degrees of, of extension, we want you to be able to use that during your rehab. If you're not right. using it, then there's no benefit, right? So let's, let's really have you um, have access to that in the games. Um, and that way, it may be a bit harder. Uh, and by a bit harder, it may be a lot harder, and that's okay. okay. Uh, but we'll I'll see. I'm up for that. Good, good. You ready? So have you begin? Yeah, well, have you begin therapy for me? Yeah. And and this is kind of what a little bit of Dr. Wolf talked about as well, with the the, the repetitions being challenging. Uh, right mm -hmm. here, Dr. Housley, you're you're making the the repetitions more challenging for Jerry here, and uh, yes. it's yep. going to be for for his benefit as well. Yep. Exactly. Yep. It's this this concept. Um, it's a it's a technical term, but it's it encapsulates things. It's it's called a sufficient stimuli, right? The stimuli is the movement, right? But your movement has to be hard enough to induce a change in our brains. If it's not sufficient, then it won't induce a change. And so we always have to make sure that we're delivering a sufficiently um, powerful stimuli to your body in order to induce those changes. So that's really what we're trying to do here. So Jerry, let's go ahead and, um, and do this one. I'm honestly, Jerry, less concerned about this one for you simply because you do have such good movement. I'm very much more concerned about its its ability to help you in these more complex games. So actually, this is good now. I see that you are, there's a little bit of a struggle here, right? <laughs> really try to get the last little bit out of it. Very good. Did you increase this? Oh, yeah. yeah I can <laughs> tell. He feels oh, it. Yeah. Jerry feels yeah. it. Yeah. Now, I'm trying yeah. not to hold my breath. Yeah, no breath holding here. No one, no one's passing out. I think you are sitting down in a chair, which is good, but still, we don't want anyone doing Valsalvas and holding their breath. So, yeah. very good. Okay. Um, I did increase it. I'm going to, let's actually um, go to the next game real quick and let's see exactly what we're dealing with. Like I said, that, that activity thermometer is good for kind of a warm up and kind of a um, um, getting some of that tone reduction. Right. But I really think for you specifically, because you do have so much good active control, we need to work on those more complex games, right? Um, again, the, the complexity of the game is also part of that sufficient stimuli, um, right. making sure it's visually um, complex and um, and making sure that it's going to be challenging enough in the temporal domain, right? Having you move and make those direction changes really quickly, that could be something that's much more complex for you. Maybe you have the range of motion, but now you don't have the precision to move um, in that movement. And that's what we're going to work on next. We're kind of layer on these capacities. Perfect. So let's go here and check this one. Let's go ahead and play. I, just, the, uh, I thought I can cook very well. Turn <laughs> <laughs> this, I can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, don't, don't leave it to us. Motor Chef will tell you you can't cook. Um, but uh, we'll, <laughs> I guess 
where the rubber meets the road is in the real kitchen. But um, yeah. but for, for modus games, yeah, it can sometimes turn out a slop. I will I will tell you guys. <laughs> I've made a lot of slop uh, yep. in in modus chef, so so I yep. don't think you're okay. on there, Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. You've made this tougher too. I can totally tell. Good. Uh, now, Jerry, too hard. You got to be honest with me. Is it too hard? No, because it makes me work harder. Okay. Now, here's the thing. I did make a rather large change. I'm going to decrease it just a touch, a couple of degrees. Because okay. I can, I'm, I'm watching the look on your face, and I can see a lot of effort. Now, I love it, but I also want this to be sustainable, okay? Yeah. Yeah, when you say sustainable there, Dr. Housley, you just, not just that Jerry can do it once, yep. um, that right, he has to get his repetitions in, and that means yep. kind of being able to do it over and over again. Yep, exactly. Okay. That's the idea, right? And, and those, all these studies, you can't just do one movement and you're done. You're done with rehab, right? You have to do all of them. Okay. Right. So I should make faces. <laughs> <laughs> well, make so the thing is, I can, I can, I can see past your faces. If you're trying to trick me and you're completing it and you're giving me a face, then I'll see right past the face. But I was seeing a combination of face, yeah. level of effort, and also some slowness in completion. So don't uh, don't try to work one over on me, Jerry. Okay. No, I like the challenge like this. Good. And okay. And we have a question here. I think uh, from the audience, from mm -hmm. from Martha, I think it is. Sure. Um, can this still help me after eleven and a half years post stroke? I think that's a you know great question as well. Uh, with with Jerry here, Jerry, how how many years are you post stroke in this case? Yeah, and I actually answered her um, because oh, I, you did. I'm ten years out, a little more than ten years out, and I still see improvements. And I and I mentioned to her that. Even those tiny little wins are victories to me. So, I mean, I'm even from walking or, or using my hand in this, picking up a glass, which I don't usually pick a glass up because I end up, it's not a good outcome for me with a glass, but it does make a big difference using this hand mark has been a really, it's been good for me. Mm -hmm. Well, Jerry, let's do this one thing. So what I want you to do is um, I want to make sure that this is good for you before we leave today. And okay. so I want you to go ahead and go through some games, go through your prescription and um, get a sample and let me know how things are going. And then what we'll do is we're going to go on to to, um, to gym real quick, I think. Perfect. And we'll, circ we'll circle back around and see how things go, okay? Oh, yes, I'll, I'll mute myself. That's Thank okay. You. Yeah, very good. I'll just quickly reintroduce everyone here. This is your Rehab Power Hour, and I'm your host, Dr. Nick Housley. Thanks so much for being here with me on this lovely Monday evening. I know we've had a, a really busy session today, and uh, please keep your questions coming. It's been great. Um, you can email me at rehabpowerhour at modusnova.com. You can also give me a call at 404-594-4244, or leave me a comment in the chat. Um, David and I are, are kind of doing uh, uh, our best to uh, tag team the um, the comments here, and I think- The questions, uh, yeah. Yeah, the questions, yeah. So yeah. Thank you so much, guys. Well, we we had another uh, good question from Polly. How can I get my clinician connected? Um, she's not familiar with the hand mentors, but who has two young children at home, so it's hard for her to make some of these later power hours. We have power hours, um, so so maybe some earlier power hours. Uh, Dr. Housley, I think on Wednesday we're we're doing an earlier one. Is that right? We are. Yeah, we have one at three p.m. And actually, that's going to be a longer one on Wednesday. So you guys can join me for a long format rehab power hour. It will be a rehab. Two hour power for hour. <laughs> double power, two double hour. power. Back double to back. Power. Uh, yeah, double header double power. power. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, but that's that'll be 3 p.m. Eastern time, Polly. Mm -hmm. So uh, please let us know if that that's something that could work uh, for your clinician, for him or her. Um, and certainly, you know, if, if it doesn't, we can try to arrange offline as well. A good yep. time, a good time to connect. Um, and I, I think Stacy's got a couple of questions here as well. Um, I had a PT tell me I needed some shoulder strength before being able to move my forearm and ultimately before I can move my hand is movement, regaining movement linear. And I think linear starting from the shoulder down is, is that, is that uh, something that you've seen Dr. Housley? Yeah. So I think this is not necessarily, there's not like a dependency here where you are going to get movement in your shoulder before you get movement in your hand, right? It, it all depends on where your stroke was and uh, a bunch of different contexts, a bunch of different factors here. And so I think that um, sort of um, stereotyping things and saying you have to work on your shoulder before you can work on your wrist and hand may be a bit misguided. And I think if you're getting movement back somewhere and you have um, the ability and the time to devote activities to the whole upper extremity, you should do that. 
Um, of course, the shoulder is important in the function, um, but so is the hand and, and, the, and, the, and the wrist. And I think one of the main things that maybe this therapist is talking about is classically their movements return quicker in your proximal joints as opposed to your distal joints, i.e. your wrist and your fingers and your hand. That's kind of a, maybe what they're drawing um, a comparison to, but that's not necessarily a definitive thing. So, so usually people might see some more movement in their shoulders earlier, uh, but that certainly doesn't mean you have to start with the mm -hmm. shoulder before doing any rehab uh, in the, you know, lower down in the, in the hand or, or um, in the, in the elbow. Um, and uh, I think Dr. Howes, your other point that every stroke is different. Every stroke survivor is different. Um, certainly all, you know, that, that rings true. Every brain is different. Every injury is different. And that, um, uh, but we certainly, you know, we see people with results um, in the wrist, in the fingers uh, using the hand mentor. And certainly we encourage uh, to, you know, Stacy, for you to continue doing your, your hand mentor training and uh, for us to, you know, to show us um, kind of your results as well uh, after your hours and, and repetitions. That That's fantastic. So, so uh, I think we want to move on to another guest here. Jim, can you, can you, we're going to go back here to Jim. Jim, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. Perfect. Great to, great to hear from you again. And uh, welcome to, uh, to be at Power Hour. Can you real quick tell us where you're calling from and uh, uh, when your injury was? Well, I'm from uh, Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and I had a stroke about two and three quarter years ago, and it affected my right side. I have um, been walking with a cane, and since I've had this, I really don't need the cane anymore. Uh, my hand is uh, affected, but not really bad. I can still use my fingers and I can eat with it and everything. But um, the problem I'm having now is about two weeks ago, the foot mentor went kaput. Mm. And uh, the replacement is, needs tweaked. Okay. 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 Very good. So, uh, two and three quarters years ago, I think your stroke was, and, uh, it's great to hear that you were walking with a cane previous and with, after doing a lot of repetitions and, um, practice on the foot mentor, you're starting to walk, uh, without your cane. If I, if I understood correctly, um, and, uh, uh we've had a swap out in your foot mentor, um, for some, some technical issues. And tonight, Hopefully, we'll get Dr. Housley to kind of tune that up for you. Yes, excellent. Very good. So, so um, Jim, give me a, give me a heads up. What do you? Uh, what's going on with your foot mentor? Well, if you can remember, about two weeks ago, I was on, and yep. uh, the pump was running like crazy, but I was getting yep. no action on the foot. So you they got replaced it. it um, in about five days, they replaced it. And uh, you can't get it uh, working like the old one was. Okay. It, it's not responding as good. And uh, there's a couple games I can't work, use at all. Okay. The this, this space shooter, I can't use in the Spiro. Okay. Well, this is exactly what I'm here for, right? I'm here to make sure that you can get as much out of this as possible. We'll do the tune-up. So let's, let's get to it, okay? Okay. So do you have your foot mentor powered on right now? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Sure. Good, good step. Where are you right now in your, in your um, console? Do you see the home screen? Are you seeing the telehealth side? What are you seeing right now? Telehealth. Okay. So let's go ahead and have you go over to the um, uh, assessment screen for me. I don't think I'm getting your screen shared right now, but we can kind of uh, not worry about that for right now. So let's go ahead and go to assessment for me. There's assessment. Okay, and what do you see on the far left side? Uh, you see another? 31. 31, okie dokie. Let me just clear data here, make sure we're getting some good information. And my foot there. is all the whole way down. Okay. There's no Very negative good. showing. There's no negative showing. No negative showing, okay, okay. No. So let's go ahead and let's have you go up into extension so bring that foot up into dorsiflexion like you're trying to bring your toes to the sky very there good is, there it is 
Beautiful. Good. Very good. Okay. Let's have you go down again for me. One more time. All the way down, all the way down. That's it. It's there to the floor. Okay. That's fine. Put, that's fine. Pedal to the metal. Pedal to the metal. Okay. Very good. So I think, Jim, what's, what's happening here, and you guys can actually see this on my side too. It looks like we have a bit of a calibration issue here. And this, can, this is okay. We can fix this. But yeah. what we can do for right now, Jim, is we can actually go through and still figure out exactly how much movement you have. And we can just use these small ranges of motion. That's that's fine for right now, but we'll get the calibration fixed up, okay? But yeah. first things first, let's go ahead and have, um, I'm going to put a little bit of help in here real quick. So, actually, I'm going to have you do this one more time for me. Go ahead and go up as far as you can for me, as far as you can. And then have you go down quickly as far as you can. Pedal to the metal for me. Beautiful. Excellent. Okay, very good. You can relax for me. So I got those numbers. Good job there. I'm going to go ahead and put a little bit of assistance in that foot mentor. I'm going to hear it kick on there. You guys can probably hear them in the background kick in. And I'm going to have you just relax as much as you can. And then we will figure out exactly how much assistance you need. Okay. So Jim, just do your best to relax, okay? Okay. Very good, very good. And we'll watch those numbers kick in, guys. You can see them start to rise up. And this is, uh, again, this movement is on the foot. I don't have a foot mentor here with me, unfortunately. But when I'm um, drawing it up into extension, um, our hand extension is similar to what we have with dorsiflexion. So this is the same movement that would happen if you're trying to prevent foot drop. You're trying to pick your foot up and you try to walk. That's that same movement. Okay, guys. Jim, you still doing okay there? We're getting pretty close to the top there. We'll go a little bit more here. Yeah, I'm okay. okay. Uh, Nick, I have some numbers from uh, before. Sure. That'll help you. Minimum, well, I, minimum okay, was go. minus 20. Max was plus 20. Assist was 1.6. And prom was 25. Okay, okay. Yeah, and I think because um, it's, it's maybe a different foot mentor, that's good information, but we're, we'll probably go off of this stuff here because also we have some of the uh, – um, if there is a, a calibration issue, we want to we want to program it based on these numbers that we're collecting here um, okay. until we can go and correct that calibration, in which case we would just go back and, um, and fix the numbers again one more time. This is okay. All right. Okay, so I'm pretty happy with this. And you're fully relaxed there? Jim, yeah, with your very good. What I'd like you to do is try to go um, slowly and gently push down into flexion for me, like you're trying to go pedal to the metal. Very good. Uh, Pretty tough, huh? Oh yeah, real tough. Okay, yeah, the foot mentor is fairly strong. I'm going to reduce that assistance just a little bit here. Okay, you're going to come down into flexion. Probably feel that come down. There we go. Coming down a little bit there. Very good. Very good. Very good. Just a little bit right about there. Okay. Very good. So um, what I want to do now is, and I know exactly why you're having trouble with the not being able to play those games, Jim. So let's go ahead and actually go back. We can kind of diagnose this in the actual gameplay. So let's go ahead and have you go back on the top left side, and we'll go to home, and we'll actually start playing some games, okay? Okay. You want me to go to the ones I can't do? Yes, please. That's always I'm always the one for the trouble, the troublesome game, the trouble situation. So that's what I'm here for. So I like the hard questions. I think a space shooter will come up first. Okay, let's get to it then. I think let's check your prescription. It does we we may have um thermometer come up first, but that's okay. Well, I mean, I mean that's the first one I can't do. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, yeah, very good. Okay, so which which game are you in now, Jim? <laughs> I'm still waiting. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> It'll probably come up strong, man. I'm going to okay. skip that one. I'm going to skip it. Okay. So while we're skipping this, let's go quickly to see if we have any questions. I think we had a couple actually come through. Um, David, are you uh, keeping up with this? I'm sorry, I haven't been a been a good host. I think David, you are on mute, my friend. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a question here from from Ian. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Once you get the hand mentor and the device, how long do you allow the hand mentor to move your hand before you try the movements? So I, I think that's an important question there. Yeah, I think this is, yeah, this is an important one. And the answer to this question is you should always try to do the movements always and forever. <laughs> uh, there's not a point when you should rely purely on the hand mentor and you not be engaged. You should always be engaged in attempting to do those move movements. Um, if that's and and, uh, try, and we were talking, yeah, we were talking about that high quality of movement, right? And you're making a distinction here, uh, Dr. Housley, in that you trying, EM, you trying to do those movements, that's towards the more high quality of movements. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, very good. Yeah, thanks for that question, EM. Now, Jim, are we uh, into the um, game right now? Space year, yeah, I paused it because you guys were talking, but. No, it's quite uh, all right. Yeah, I was going to come right back to you. So, so let me know what's going on, Jim, on your side. Are you able to get to the far right-hand side of the screen? I'm at far right. Okay. That's as far as I'll go. I can't move. It can't go anywhere else. It's clear to the far, and uh, I so can't you're, go. You're on, you're on the right-hand side of the screen. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's do a couple so, of things here. Your screen's going to pause, Jim. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. That's just me modifying something. So go ahead and hit play again, and let's try again. Okay. Okay, it's almost to the left. Okay. Now, are you able to get to the far right-hand side, too? I'm going to the right. Okay. But How about to the left? When I push my foot down, it ain't moving. It's not moving. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's just shooting, shooting, but it ain't, it ain't moving left at all. It's clear to the right. Left at all. Okay. Well, let's go a little bit lower here. Go ahead. It's going to pause one more time for me. So what we're going to actually, we're going to pause it one more time too. So Jimmy, still there? Yeah. Excellent. So go ahead and hit play for me. Let me know how that goes. Okay, it's clear to the left, and the pump's running, and I moved it to the right. Okay. And that's as far as it goes. I can't move it again. It's not It's not going to the left at all. It's clear to the right. Okay. So it's going to pause one more time. Go ahead and it play. Was all the, it was all the way on the left, and now it's all the way on the right. Is that is that right, Jim? Well, it starts out to the left, and when okay, the pump okay. comes on, it moves it across the screen, and it goes clear to the right. Now, I'm pushing down on it, and it's not moving at all. Mm -hmm. It's still stuck to the right. Yeah, this is, this is interesting, so let's go ahead and do this really quickly. Okay. Yeah, we may have a. I am trying to reduce that pump there, Jim. It looks like we're not able to fully zero that out. Let's actually have you go um, hit the back button again on the top left for me. Uh, let's go ahead and. There should be a little home button in the top left. Yeah. If you pause the screen, press that home button for me. I did. Okay. That should bring you back to the home screen. What I'd like you to do is go back into um, the game. We'll try it one more time. It's going to take me a while to get to that game. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Well, let's actually um, let's do one in the, in the in the meantime. Well, which game do you have to start with? Well, the first one that comes up will be that. Thermometer game. Thermometer. Yeah, let's go ahead and try. Let's go to strongman though, real quick. Let's try strongman. Okay, wait a minute. That strongman was really jerky. Okay. My wife says, "How comes that guy's so shaking so much?" I says, <laughs> yeah, "I think he's nervous. <laughs> he's lifting okay. a really heavy weight." So here it is. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, do a repetition for me. Just 
the pump's not working. Okay. My foot's going up and down. The pump is not coming on at all. Yep, yep. That's that's expected. Um, that that is expected. So no worries there. That is normal. Okay. So now here we go. Now it's going to pause, and then you're going to go ahead and let's go ahead and um, go play it one more time for me. Just please relax. Okay. It says now push the pump's on. Down. My foot down. Okay. Is up. There's our pump. Very good. And uh, it's up. Now I'll push down. Nothing's okay. happening. My okay. foot's going down. Okay, the, the bar on the left, right's going down. Good, good. Stop. I can't push no more. I'm pushing, pushing. Nothing's happening. He's, he's really jerking. <laughs> yeah, really jerking. Okay. Yeah, I think Jim, I think it looks like we might have an, an angle sensor issue too. So let's um I think we could probably get that figured out. Um we'll, we'll be sure to there. yeah. We'll be sure to uh get you all uh squared away uh here, Jim. Uh and uh right as we're approaching the end here, we want to make sure we answer some of these questions um as well with from from our audience. Um and we have a question here from uh, let's see. Or Rose, uh, let's let's make sure to go to Rose as well. Rose, can you hear us? Well, maybe Rose give. We'll give Rose a few seconds here. Uh, you might be muted, Rose. We cannot hear you. Well, we have a question uh, while we wait on Rose a little bit for, for her audio here. Uh, we have a question, uh, oh, Dr. Really? House. Hello? Oh, yes. Yeah. Rose, can you hear us? Yes, Perfect. I can hear you. Great, uh, great, great to have you Rose. on, Rose. Can, oh, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you. Great to have can, you. Can, fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit about your, uh, your injury and where you're calling from? Well, I had a stroke at my friend's place back in July in Connecticut. And um, yeah, I was sent to a hospital and then to a rehab center, then to a subacute rehab center. And then I came home to fall again. And I, oh. I fell, I went to Mount Sinai in New York and I went to another rehab center in New York. So I'm just like desperate now. I mean, I'm 41. <laughs> I'm really young to have a stroke. Yeah. Um, sure. I just want to know, like, it seems to be working from what I'm doing, um, but whoa, um, it seems like the arm of the motor's hand, where you put the arm, is not completely centered. Okay. Yeah, I think we were talking a little bit about this, um, Rose, before we were kind of formally on Red Power Hour, and I think... Maybe it would be helpful. Um, are you able to show me kind of your setup here really quickly? Yeah. Okay. And I'd like to kind of see exactly how you have it set up because I think these um, these fit issues are um, often easily addressed. And uh, it can just be maybe a positional thing or maybe we tighten some straps. So let's go ahead and try to get that camera so I can see exactly what's going on. Is so there we go. That's a little better. Yeah. Okay. okay. I think I'm... Still seeing uh, uh, a head in the top right hand side, and, uh, and it looks like the ceiling. Oh, you're doing the other way. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Oh, okay, that's much better. That's a good hand mentor review. Maybe could we um, zoom out a little bit, just a little bit, just maybe wow. put the camera away. Yeah. Okay, okay, um, very good. That that wrist alignment looks reasonably good. Um, now let's go ahead and look at your forearm and your elbow quick. Um, Okay, okay, okay. So yeah, I think this um, largely looks okay on my end. It's kind of hard to see, kind of the camera's moving around a little bit there. Um, so let's have you maybe move out a little bit um, further away so I can get a better view. Further away, further away. Yes. Well, I'll have you tilt the camera up a little bit. Tilt the camera up a little bit further away. And then tilt the up. camera up, more vertical for me. Up, 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 up. No, that's down. Up, up, up. No. <laughs> the other way. What? There you the other go. Way. Okay. Okay. So okay. I think, um, so, so Rose, tell me exactly what you mean by feeling kind of unstable. Um, can you maybe describe or point to where that's coming from? It's just, 
it's like the hand mentor where the arm, the elbow, elbow is kind of not centered on. Yeah. The, the so this is, is um. Like that? Yeah. So let me give you let me give you a quick rundown here. I think what you're describing is that there might be a little bit of a misalignment between your elbow and the end of the hand mentor. Now this is completely dependent on how big your arm is. Okay. So if you have a, a smaller arm in forearm size, you may experience that the, the back of the hand mentor kind of kicks off a little bit outside of you, back past your elbow. Totally fine, guys. Totally fine. The thing that you got to mention is, well, I'll just stand up here really quickly so you can see, is it's okay for it to go past your elbow a little bit. You can see my elbow is down here. And it's going to kick past my elbow a little bit. You don't want to have happen is it to rotate off like that. You don't want that to happen. Okay. So what you want to do is if, it, if you find it is a little bit, um, let's say, less stable, what I recommend doing is coming through and really cinching up these two Velcro pads, these Velcro straps here. Oh, they, should yeah. be, they should be fairly snug, right? Um, and not to the point where it's going to cause you pain, but they may need to be um, fairly snug. Like for me, I can get maybe a finger at it's most. Snug. In here. It's, just, it's, a, it's the centering of the arm. It like the centering, the centering should be okay, right? As long as it's, um, as long as it's in line with your, um, your wrist and your hand, you should be good to okay, go. Okay, okay, got it. Yep, yep, no worries there. And the one thing that I will mention, Rose, is if you find it's a little bit uncomfortable, I think what people try to do is they try to have it straight like this, okay? Where you, okay. Where you have arm kind of straight like this. You don't need to do this. You can have the cords coming off the right hand side for me, or if it's the left hand side, they come off this way, and you can have your elbow bent. And if you have your elbow bent, in that case, oh. maybe rotate it in a little bit. That's totally fine. And that means it's a little more comfortable. This part, if it is going back past your elbow, it's not going to hit your forearm or your um, your uh, um, your humerus here, your upper arm. So I would recommend just rotating it in a little bit. And then you have a much better, more comfortable position. So oh. that's the first thing. That issue is key. And is then this, like yeah, that? I think that's, uh, I can't really see that, unfortunately. Okay. So have, maybe if you move the camera back. Move the camera back. Yeah, I do. Can you um, see it? Yeah, I, I think that's actually okay, Rose. Um, okay. The only thing I recommend here is making sure those straps are sufficiently tight. Yeah, um, those two tight. So the other thing I wanted to mention, so that's the forearm side. Um, it did look like your um, the actual pad on the top, I often call it the clamshell, the shell part, that oh. also needs to be fairly snug too, right? Because What's going to happen yeah, yeah. is if it's not snug, you're going to be moving around in the hand mentor, and it's not going to be able to detect that. So you have to yeah. really okay. kind of clamp this guy down a little bit. And again, like okay. I was saying earlier, okay. it's not going to be rigidly affixed to you. There's going to be some movement. Totally fine. Okay. And you have to adjust it if you're working really hard, which we all should be. There's going to be some play with you interacting with the hand mentor. Maybe after 10, 15, 20 minutes, you have to kind of go and make sure that your straps are still tight. Totally fine. Do that. That's what the wrist breaks are for. But just make sure that you have it fairly snug okay. and you should have a good interface with the hand mentor. And that will help you um, get more out of it. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah. No, I think you were you were totally on the right track. Just a little bit of fine tuning is what we needed to do there. Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. I feel like the 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 clam of uh, the Yeah, the clamshell, yeah. Is eggshell. Um I think it is snug. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think the, the, key, the key thing for you in that situation is, are you slipping out of it? If you're not slipping out of it, then you're probably tight enough. Um, the only other thing I recommend, too, is if the, the thing we might want to worry about is you may still not slip out of it, but if it's not too tight, you may get a little bit of movement in this direction. So imagine my hand, you might get some movement this way, and that can cause some skin irritation. So the other reason why we want it to be fairly snug is it needs to be a firm attachment so you're not getting a lot of play between your skin and that foam pad. So that's the other rubbing. key thing. Yeah, the rubbing, exactly right, Dave. Okay, well, Rose, I, hopefully that was helpful. I don't know if I see yeah. your audio or video. Okay, very good. Any other questions for me? Um, no, I guess, I guess I have, if I have it on right, then. Yeah. Um, so, so basically, so my, my hand mentor was working in the morning. And I, hmm. um, and he told me to restart the computer, and I did, and and then now it works fine. But yeah, uh, sometimes that happens, right? Sometimes you know, if we get a software update, 
Um, sometimes it just needs to be um, restarted. You know, just like a computer or a phone, um, sometimes it just requires a restart. Um, it's technology. And so that's a, that's a good habit to do, just to kind of maybe um, um, do a restart every now and then. And um, you'll if something's really kind of acting funny and not expected, always just do a power cycle and I'll restart and kind of reset the uh, kind of a shake it out of the stupor. No worries there. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I think that's, that's about it. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Very good. Think, um, as always, Rose, um, we're, you're more than welcome to give us a call anytime. Um, that's what we're here for, um, technically or clinically, right? So if you have these questions about fitting, come back, let us know. We'll, we'll help you because I'm sure other people have these kind of comments and I think it's good to have, um, have this shared experience together. So. Okay. Perfect. Okay, thank well, well, thank you so much, Rose, um, for, for coming on. Yeah, and, and we'll have to have you back maybe in a, a couple of weeks as well uh, to, to check in on you to make sure things are still mm -hmm. going well. Yeah, uh, in the yeah. meantime, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Very, um, very good. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us evening, this evening. Uh, we also have a, a, a couple of questions here, uh, Dr. Housley, I want sure. to make sure that we sure. get to. Um, a question from um, uh, Magdalena, I, I think it is. Um, my husband is experiencing numbness in his left hand and tingling in his right hand, um, and he has full movement on both hands. Are those sensations of nerve regeneration, and will the robot help with that too? Um, mm. He also has, a second and second part of the question, he also has foot drop, uh, when we were thinking of the foot mentor, what are your thoughts on that? And, and apologies, yeah. that was Maggie. That was a question from Maggie. Yeah, I gotcha. Okay, so there's a couple of things here. So with respect to foot drop, we'll start uh, at the uh, outset and go backwards. I guess the most recent question. So with respect to foot drop, and if there's some neuropathy, uh, whether it's purple nerve or from the stroke following um, uh, uh, an injury, I think, um, then the the foot mentor is designed to help that, right? I think Maggie, it would be good to clarify. I don't know, did your husband have a stroke or is it some other neurologic conditions going on? Did he have some damage in his brachial plexus? Um, is what, what's really the reason why we have that, um, uh, the numbness and tingling and the, um, yeah. Oh, Maggie, ooh, we have a video here. Hi. So hey. this again, hi. <laughs> hey, how are you guys doing? Um, yeah. Good, thank you. So he, uh, everything just happened after the stroke. So he had a stroke and okay. then he had a heart attack. Uh, he had a, he had a uh, craniectomy. Um, craniectomy. Okay. They removed part of the cerebellum. He was on life support for three weeks. And, you know, it was a very long, so, yeah, interesting yeah, sure. stroke. Sure, yeah. I mean, it's, just, um, it's always a complex um, uh, situation. So I think, um, the, the, with respect to the foot mentor and the foot drop, the, the foot mentor is designed specifically to help people with foot drop, um, right? It is designed to help people learn to what's called dorsiflex. That's the movement that allows your foot not to basically hit and touch and grab their grab their ground. Um, so it is designed to do that. It also has um, is the ability to help you with push off, um, and that's a fancy way of saying helping you walk faster and longer. And that's what the uh -huh. trials are shown. So it does help you um, in both of those situations. So it helps you on the sensory and motor side. Um, um, on the lower extremity as well as the upper extremity. Now, with respect to the uh, hand mentor, you guys brought up some really interesting points about um, maybe sensory kind of sensations. Um, the clinical trials haven't focused on those individual evaluations. So we don't know if the hand mentor, using a hand mentor for three months or 100 days or however many hours, um, helps improve people's numbness or tingling. Um, or those sort of sensation-based um, uh, uh, phenomena. Um, we focus a lot on what are called um, motoric functions, things like you volitionally grabbing something, right? Mm -hmm. um, or you um, you having some strength back in your arm. Now, now those, those sort of functional-based measures are not just motoric. They actually do require some sensory components too, but we haven't been able to parcel out which one is as being helped more than the other. So we don't know specifically if the hand mentor will help a pure sensory problem versus we know it will help a motor problem, um, but we don't know if it will help the the, um, the 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 sensory component. So, so yeah, we suspect Dr. Housley, did. No, describe, what Dr. Housley is describing is that uh, the, the studies, the clinical research is really focused on looking at if uh, movement is better or movement as in function mm -hmm. yeah function yeah function as well not so much uh, uh focused on looking at if there's an improvement in sensation 
uh, which is kind of that tingling that you're describing. Mm -hmm. But but if I under, uh, but if I uh, um, understand correctly, uh, Dr. Housley, uh, that that tingling, that that sensation, that's also might have been damaged by the stroke, um, and is something that can come back uh, with with uh, with practice. Uh, mm -hmm. but perhaps not a, such a strong indicator for, for movement one way or the other yeah. uh, for the yeah, sensation think, and movement crossover. Yeah, I mean, with respect to the sensations you're describing, uh, those those sensations are consistent with a regeneration process of a peripheral nerve. Like, if, let's say if you cut a peripheral nerve in my forearm here, that peripheral will grow back. It will. Uh, it may not grow to the right place, but it will grow back. And as you as it grows back, it will generate the, um, these sorts of phantom sensations. And so um, those can be perceived, right? Sensations really all in our brains, effectively. They can be perceived in different ways. And so um, the extent to which that's your, your description is consistent with regeneration, I think, is true. Um, now, I'm not sure if that's due to the stroke or if there was maybe some um, peripheral nerve injury because of your surgeries that you had, these sorts of things as well. Um, you know, also being in a bed for a long time, just that sort of ability to, to move and having, um, I guess, the ability to not move can cause a lot of problems as well. So that can cause nerve damage too. So you could be experiencing some um, uh, some symptoms and some signs that are maybe associated with your stroke, but not necessarily due to your stroke, just because of your experience in the hospital system. Okay. So the thing, if, so if, if I may, the, the, mm -hmm. go, okay. sorry, go ahead, Medaki. If those sensations started, that numbness and that uh, that firing from occasional time to time, that um, how do you want to explain it? Like, uh, like a shock. Like a like a shock that mm -hmm. that started a few months mm -hmm. after the okay. stroke. I'm assuming it might be regeneration. Something is going on. He just maybe that's what he's. Yeah. Yeah, so I think there are there's there's a couple of things too that I should mention as well that you can have there's two ways. Well, let's simplify here in a, in a short sense here. There are two ways that you can have these sorts of sensations. One is that there's actual direct damage to a peripheral nerve. Like mm -hmm. if I were to cut my cut my nerve, and that would cause some damage and cause actual physical biologic damage. Now, but what can also happen is in your brain because all the sensations are realized in our brains. Um, you can have a rewiring happening, which is causing you to perceive those sensations, even though there's no damage that's happening in your arm or in your leg or, or, or so forth. So it could be some, and this, this is um, sort of a, we don't talk about this that much, but there's a term called maladaptive plasticity. Um, this is, you can get from the word there, maladaptive meaning not good. There are ways that the brain can reorganize that are not so good. Um, and that can happen after disuse or not moving, um, but it can also happen just naturally, kind of spontaneously. And um, this could be one of the reasons why you're experiencing that. And it happens after the fact and with no associated peripheral damage per se, like an injury. So it could be central. It could be in your brain that's actually experiencing this, not actually some some phenomenon that's happening in your arm or your leg. Okay. So, so I'm, I, unfortunately, Dr. yeah, unfortunately, yeah. I'm not able to really give a good, a, a firm evaluation just because it's really hard to yeah. do, do an evaluation over the phone. So, and 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 some sometimes, um, yeah, with amputees uh, or individuals with that nerve damage, they can have that pain there, um, mm -hmm. and uh, it could either, like you said, be damaged down here um, in the actual sensational parts, sure, or sure. Be, the damage could be up here in how that those signals are being interpreted. It could be either the sensors that are- This is common after stroke too, Dave, right? This yeah. is common after stroke where even yeah. if there is no damage to the limb, um, and, damage and, to the cortex itself directly will cause yeah. these, these problems to emerge. And then uh, going towards kind of the treatments for some of these, mm -hmm. uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, pains, these nerve pains, uh, what, what kind of treatments are they? If I, if I understand correctly, a lot of them involve movement. Yeah, so um, there's, of course, the, the pharmacologic route um, where you can, there are medications that can help manage these, these sorts of symptoms. Um, but if, let's put it this way, if it is a cortical-like phenomenon, if it's coming from a change in your brain that's basically misinterpreting some signal, um, and what I mean by that is like, if I touch my skin, I feel myself touching it, but it, maybe after a stroke, after rewiring, I touch my arm here and it feels like sharp stinging pain, right? That would be an, a, an example of that reorganization that's maladaptive, that's not helpful, that's bad. Um, a lot of what can happen in these sort of non-pharmacologic approaches, what they do is clinician training. 
where this is basically you kind of do some exposure to it and you have to basically just like we did with movement you have to relearn that these sensations are not harmful it has to be done very carefully um, and I would encourage you to reach out to a physical occupational therapist with experience doing this um, sort of work. Um, and movements, movements will be a part of that, um, likely, um, as well as sensation desensitization training, which will basically be like touching the various parts of the body, trying to induce it, but in a very controlled way. Um, and so it's the same sort of concept as you would have um, uh, trying to induce ease of motor function. It's just, it's just a different modality that you use to actually um, help. Okay. Um, second question for the foot, um, for the mm -hmm. foot mentor. So mm -hmm. he's having, besides the sensation, he, um, the, I think the biggest challenge that we're facing is, is his balance. Um, mm -hmm. Since he had a part of the cerebellum removed, uh, yeah. I, we have been told that it's going to eventually, it's going to rewire. Um, but now the question is um, what kind of, uh, what can we expect from the foot mentor? Um, how can he's walking with a cane right now? One, okay. which is fantastic. Good. Through what already went through. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, congratulations. And um, we we at the hospital. I, he they they did say that uh, you know he had the foot drop, and now some doctors are saying it's foot drop. Some doctors are saying spasticity. I want to make sure that we're pretty much on the same page. Uh, sure. And we're looking for for anything that will help him with actually walking and not sure, losing sure. balance. Yeah. Okay. So I think this um, this idea of foot drop and spasticity they're not always uh, separable with respect to the lower extremity, right? Because the primary way that you get that, um, uh, or I guess the most common way you get that foot drop is a combination of things, right? It's a it's a weakness in the front part of your calf that allows you to actually bring your foot up and not drop right yeah, yeah. so if i'm like this ta okay um can uh, contracts and we talked about this as a previous power hour I'll kind of i'll point you guys to that um and it shows the anatomy and there's a weakness of this smaller muscle and in the muscle in the back of our calf which are basically our big calf muscles you can kind of see on most people um and those actually become overactive and so it's a combination of weakness on the one side which is just a smaller muscle in addition to spasticity bone kicking in on the stronger muscle. And the result there is this imbalance. Um, I always talk about this in terms of a tug of war, right? In the upper extremities, the tug of war always wins in flexors. With respect to the lower extremities, that's why we get this posture like this. With our lower extremities, well, we don't get this posture curled up. We get an extended posture where your foot points and our muscles in the bottom really contract. And these muscles here are smaller and can't overpower it. So this is why the foot mentor is designed the way it is to help you overpower those um, stronger muscles and help you regain the ability to contract and volitionally control those tibialis anterior muscles, which help you actually dorsiflex. So it is designed specifically um, with stroke survivors in mind um, to help with that that sort of situation. So if I could kind of help summarize here, Nick, sure, what you're sure. saying is um, with regards to the original question, spasticity and foot drop, the two are somewhat interconnected. Um, you can mm -hmm. get uh, the spasticity can be part of the reason why there's foot drop and then yep. there's foot drop uh, and, and, uh, and and it just has to do with that imbalance imbalance between the two muscles. Uh, mm -hmm. With the foot mentor, it's designed specifically to help practice, help strengthen the muscles that are on the front side so that we can uh, uh, lift the foot up and not be pointed yep. into that into that foot drop. Yep. So specifically it's designed yep. for that training. So whether or not it's spasticity, you want to call it spasticity, you want to call it foot drop, you want to call it both. Um, uh, in either situation, the, the foot mentor is designed to help with that that kind of uh, uh, that kind of practice. Yeah. And uh, in regards to walking with a cane, that, that's fantastic news, Maggie. That's great to hear. Um, you know, that's great progress. And, and uh, I think that goes to Jim earlier, uh, one of the users we had on earlier, he was also walking with a cane prior to using the, the foot mentor. And by uh, from using the foot mentor, he's now able to walk without his cane. And, and certainly, you know, we can't, it's impossible. Every stroke is different. I'm sure you've heard this. There's no promises here, but we have a, we have many users that use the foot mentor specifically uh, to help their foot drop. And, and that's exactly what it was designed to do. Mm. And I will, I will mention one more thing. I know we we're, again, I appreciate everyone for sticking around. We were past the hour and we're always into the rehab power hour and a half. 
Um, yeah. It's okay. But so one more thing, Maggie, I think is really important to mention too with the foot mentor is that it also, um, I'll, I'll circle back around why this is important. It operates in multi multiple dimensions. So the foot, the hand mentor operates in flexion and extension. Okay. But the foot mentor operates in what are called off sagittal movements. So, and this is really important for balance. Okay. So when I move like this, I'm, I'm moving in a sagittal plane right now, but with our feet, our feet and our ankles re are required to move in multiple dimensions, right? Because when we, yeah, exactly. Dave, he's, he's, he's demonstrating that. And this is important for balance because we have a couple strategies that you can acquire biologically that will help you balance. And being able to control the three-dimensional position of your foot and ankle is one of the ways that you can kind of vector some of the force to help you overcome some balance um, issues. And so if you can't control the, the complex orientation of your foot, that's going to challenge your balance. And so by nature, being able to train in multiple dimensions, you're going to help with that fine control of your ankle, which can help ultimately with balance. So just to kind of circle back around to that other thing that you mentioned about balance, super important, right? Because we don't want to have falls. Falls has a whole bunch yeah. of downstream consequences you want to avoid. So let's get it strong. Let's let's prevent foot drop, which causes a lot of falls in, inherently. And then let's, let's also work on the, the balance that is, is very important um, um, uh, uh, for, for, um, for, not, for not falling as well. Yeah, and and a little bit about what uh, uh, Dr. Housley is talking about the, on the hand mentor, it's right. It's just a lot of up and down. Mm -hmm. The foot mentor has that up and down, and then it has these these off sagittal. I'm not mm -hmm. doing a great job of demonstrating, but you yep. can you can kind of see there's this inversion and yep. eversion, turning well, the foot inwards so, and outwards. Yeah, as well. so imagine my feet are like this, guys, right? And you want to turn curl your foot in and out, right? And that's how you can walk on uneven surfaces. That's how you can walk on a curb. These sorts of things. You can go out and walk. Well, if you're on leaning a one way, yeah. to to yeah. kind of correct and balance back towards your yep. center center of gravity. Exactly. Um, and yep. and the foot mentor is designed to to help with that as well. Um, and and really geared towards how you know the, the the engineering behind it was how do we get people what they need in order to start mm -hmm. walking again safely and also if they can walk safely to get them to walk faster uh, because that speed in walking is also very important for function you got to be able to cross the road in a certain amount of time you know you have to be able to 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 yep. to uh to walk in a uh, both distance and speed so that's that's mm -hmm. really what the the foot mentor is is about um it, it sounds like from you know uh, from what, as much as we can we can do over kind of a video chat um, that it, it is something that that could be helpful but of course it really comes down to um doing the repetitions and and seeing if we we get the results and that's 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 why we always encourage our you know everyone everyone that's had a stroke whether or not you're a foot mentor hand mentor user or, or anyone that's had a stroke do your more hours do more repetitions and that's what's going to help right mm -hmm. thank you yeah. Well, thanks guys for being here. I really appreciate it. I want to quickly thank um, Dr. Wolf. I know he had to sign off. Um, and I want to thank Jim and Jerry for being on here as well. And, um, and it's, it's been, as always, it's been great for uh, to have everyone here. Um, thanks, Maggie, for your questions. And I'll just uh, thank you for being here as well. And I'll just quickly uh, remind everyone that our next session is going to be Wednesday at 3 p.m. As we just said earlier, it's going to be a double session, a long one. Um, so do join me for that. Keep me company. Um, we'll have some good content there and do some cool assessments and maybe talk about some more science. Um, and as always, we're here, right? If you guys have questions or comments, reach out to us. Um, feel free to um, chat with me in the support group. I'll be there to answer your questions um, or give us a call if you have questions um, and uh, you feel more comfortable doing that. Um, I guess as, as always, everyone, I hope you have a great rest of your evening and I will look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. All right. Thanks, Dave, for being here. Thanks everyone. Thank great to be here and uh, great, great seeing everyone. And no, you know, we're, we're always here to, to push more hours. So go get, go out there and get your rehab and get your hours. Okay. All right, everyone. Bye for now. Hey, Nick, this is Jim. Yes, Jim. <laughs>